So thank you. Uh, like Per said, my name is Kelly Robinson. Um, I work at Twilio. Who here is familiar with Twilio? So Twilio is a platform for communications. And so uh, if you ever get a text message, an automated text message, there's a good chance that that's coming through Twilio. Um, we also have products for voice, video, uh, authentication. And so about five years ago, we acquired Authy. Uh, and so Authy is our product for account security that's using uh, SMS as well as other more secure options for doing authentication for our users. Uh, so I work on Twilio's Authy APIs um, for things like phone verification and multi-factor authentication. I also spend a good amount of time educating developers. It's part of my role to write technical content and best practices. My audience is generally developers that are implementing this in their systems. And so this talk is going to incorporate a lot of the things that I've learned in my last 18 months there about dealing with developers and what they, they like to know and how paranoid we should make them. So when we talk about account takeovers and account fraud, uh, it's a pretty common problem. It dropped off in 2015 there. Uh, when, that was when credit card chips were introduced. But I just read an article last week that says even chip readers, uh, a lot of people are still swiping. And so that fraud is back up to $5.1 billion in 2017. So this is a really big problem that we're trying to prevent. Um, and all of this is happening because online identity is fallible. Uh, we'd like to believe that we have foolproof systems of proving who we, we are, who we say we are, uh, but it's all baked into systems based on other systems. Uh, and how we design those systems and establish that trust is part of what we're going to be walking through today. Uh, so I want to talk about trust anchors and how they relate to authentication. Uh, generally, this is in cryptographic systems. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, a public key so that you might have that's uh, linking to a chain of trust. But I'm using this as a more generic term. Uh, and I like this definition that a trust anchor is an established point of trust from which an entity begins the validation of an authorized process process. And I think this relates back to a lot of the stuff that we do with identity. Um, because eventually we're basically going back to a form of identity that we do trust and basing our other forms of identity and therefore authentication on top of that. And we can use identity anchors in the same way. Uh, I'm going to break down the identities that we use and talk about them in the three categories. These are three categories that I invented. So if you disagree with them, just let me know. Uh, so the first is physical identities. And so these are biometrics that we can't change about ourselves, uh, or at least change very easily. Uh, the second is government identities. Um, and these are things that are generally state issued. And finally, uh, what I'm calling contextual identities. Um, and so these are identities that we've established with the internet most. Um, and these are generally more easy to change. So if you're varying identi verifying identity with a trusted contact, with someone that you know, you're probably doing that with one of your physical identities. If you go you know, into a store and like, you know the shop owner and you've been there before, they're, they're verifying because they say, I know that person. This is how your parents know who you are. And a lot of the stuff that we do uh, comes back to kind of this physical identity. And so this is a lot of times the trust anchor that we have for our identification systems. This is a very trustworthy form of uh, identity management. Being able to say that I recognize that person is very valuable. Um, and then we get into verifying identities with untrusted contacts. Um, and that is often done with government identities. But we're passing the trust to another body, and we're saying that we do trust that body. And obviously, this is going to fall apart if you have a corrupt government and if you don't trust the government as much. This is not quite as a perfect system. Um, but we're essentially saying that I trust the government knows that person when you have things like passports and government-issued IDs. And finally, we end up with these contextual identities that may not guarantee much of anything. Um, and so these are a lot of what online accounts are, are using identities for validation. And so the idea here is that trust is this waterfall. And at the end of the day, we're all going back on someone's word. So why is identity verification hard? And this ties into the authentication that we're going to be talking about. And that's because these systems are imperfect. And the biggest problem here is that we really may never know if we got this right. There's not some way that we can go validate it later. We don't usually have the option of going back to that person and asking three of their closest friends of saying, wait, is this actually Jared? Like, We don't know that. And we're probably not going to take the time and resources to do that. Uh, and so we're just trying to prove to some system that we are who we say we are and that we're not a robot. And we're doing this with usernames, passwords, captchas, SMS, and more options. So what are we going to do about this? And this is where our strategies for authentication come in. 
So I think a lot of us agree that passwords aren't enough. We just had the great talk from Miranda about why password reuse is a problem. I like this came from a real application, uh, an iOS app that just straight up told users, don't reuse your bank password. <laughs> Um, but this came out uh, from Troy Hunt last week that's, you know, password insert thing here is going to kill passwords. No, it's not. Like, passwords aren't really going anywhere. We've all seen Per Shirt today. These are things that are going to be around a lot, but if these are things that are going to be in our systems and things that we're going to be continuing to deal with, how do we add extra layers of security on top of that? And we do that right now with multi-factor authentication. Um, we add these extra layers of security with that. And there are a lot of ways that you can add additional factors for something like MFA. And I'm not going to get into the philosophical debate about what constitutes MFA. There's an entire talk about that tomorrow. But the authentication that we're talking about are things that generally fall into the category of 2FA or MFA. So most people outside of tech are really familiar with SMS as a 2FA. Um, a lot of people in this room may know of other options, but I'm sure that we're all using services that are still using SMS for 2FA, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's the most popular form out there. It's easy to use, and mobile platforms are making it even easier. Android has had this autofill feature for a while. Uh, iOS just added this one-touch uh, add your 2FA code from your messages feature in iOS 12.1, I think. And so these are things that the mobile platforms are trying to make even easier for users to use. Um, and I think the biggest part with this is that the barrier to entry for this is really low. And a, a lot of what we talk about here is how we can make this easier for users. And one of the reasons that people love using SMS, and when we talk to potential clients, a lot of times they only want to use SMS because they don't want to make their users download an app. They have a lot of users that might not have smartphones or they you know, just want to make sure that people will turn on 2FA, and this is the generally the, the lowest barrier to entry form of 2FA that people have. And so, so many people have a cell phone that can accept text messages now, um, and this is one of the only methods that doesn't really require any setup. Um, so I really struggled to get more acronyms on this page, but I think I, think I did pretty well. Uh, this just cut out? Okay. Uh, so, there's a lot of reasons that we talk about using SMS for 2FA and, and MFA and why it's bad. Um, and so SS7 vulnerabilities, who's familiar with this? Um, so a couple of people. What this basically does is oversimplified uh, explanation here, but there are telephony carriers are on very antiquated systems of trust. And so I'm in Sweden right now. My telephone carrier is in the US. When I travel to Sweden, the Swedish carrier here says, hey, Kelly's over here, send her text messages through our carrier because she's in Sweden and you don't have coverage here. And uh, you know, Verizon in the US is like, cool, sounds good. We've worked with you before. Uh, you know, I think that you know, makes sense. Uh, we, we, we see that Kelly's in, the, in, in Sweden too. Cool, sounds good. Um, and so there's kind of this handshake agreement that happens there. And you know, hackers can impersonate carriers. They can get kind of in the middle of that, uh, in, into the middle of that transaction. There's ways that they can exploit the um, signaling system seven. That's what SS7 stands for, to basically intercept messages that way. Um, SIM swapping is one of the main reasons that people talk about this. And this is basically you can socially engineer a or bribe a phone company to put somebody's phone number on a new SIM card and send it to you. And so if I have a vindictive ex-boyfriend that wants to get all of my text messages and he can call up Verizon and convince them that he's you know, just doing me a favor to get my phone uh, reset, then all of a sudden he has access to all of my phone contacts and all my text messages. Um, and finally, like this is not an end-to-end -end encrypted uh, uh, messaging platform. And so there is the possibility for those man-in-the-middle attacks. And if you do at end up having an interception of these, um, <coughs> or you get access to people's, um, you know, I think it's Verizon. There's a couple of cell phone carriers that actually will, you can log in on Android, I think, that you can actually see your text messages online. And so there's different ways that you can start to view this information. Um, but one of the things that I like to remind people is that SMS 2FA is still better than no 2FA. Um, and I think this is something that like a lot of people, you know, uh, we, we, we as security researchers don't mind uh, spending extra time on this, but the average user out there 
doesn't care about SS7 vulnerabilities. They're not thinking about this. And the more that we try to scare people with this stuff, the more they're just going to start to tune us out. Um, and this is, you know, you start to have to think about where this advice becomes relevant to certain people. Obviously, like high profile individuals. Like, you know, I don't think that we want Barack Obama using 2FA uh, via SMS for his like email account. Like, that's probably someone that we want to encourage to have more security. But he knows he's a target. Um, and so there's people, and there's people that know that they have to take the extra measures. But to the average person, this is not something that we're always going to be needing to worry about. So this paper is really great. It talks about the rational rejection of security advice by users. Um, and it has a lot of these really like good reasons that people and, and the average users just reject security advice. And I really like this quote. Uh, so if we're not going to be using SMS for 2FA, there are a lot of other options that we can start to encourage people to use. Um, and I do want to, like, I like to encourage people to use these. I mean, Twilio's main business is SMS, but I spend most of my time telling people to use other things. Um, so uh, one of the big re w ways that we can do this is uh, U2F, universal two-factor. Um, and so or second form, I forget what that stands for. Uh, but Google got a lot of press recently because they had all their employees start using YubiKeys, and they haven't had a way, an employee get hacked since they did that. And so this is a really maybe more secure way that people can start to use um, more token-based authentication. This is a hardware token on the key, and the device will authenticate you when you sign into your, um, your accounts. Um, push authentication is another form of very secure 2FA. Um, this uses public key cryptography, and so there's a private key on your device and the public key goes to the server. Um, you can do this with apps like Duo or Authy. Um, and this is a way that adds an extra layer of security so you have a private key per device and per account. And so even if the end, the server like Twilio or Duo servers get hacked, there's only the public key that the hackers will get access to. That's probably still encrypted. And so there's not as much of a, a, a threat uh, to the end user for getting this hacked. And um, this is also a, a really easy way for people to do authentication. I think we have a, a, a really nice usability in this form because people don't have to type in that number. They can just accept or de uh, deny the request. And one of the things that I always tell people about this form of uh, MFA is that it also is one of the only options that people have for actually giving um, negative feedback to the request. And so you can actually use this to build in webhooks that will take action if users are denying a lot of requests. Um, and so this is a way that you can start to say, hey, I think these accounts are like, you know, we have like either a DDoS attack happening or there's somebody that's actively trying to hack these accounts. Um, there's different ways that you can use this to uh, take action against denied requests, which most of the other options don't have. Um, TOTPs are starting to become uh, more familiar to users. So these are time-based one-time passwords. These are, you know, you scan the QR code and you get this counting down token um, on your device. And so this is also an app-based method, but it, it's one of the ways that's a little bit easier for users to understand, mostly because it's been around a little bit longer than some of these other methods. And I think this, this takes time for users to start to uh, grasp and understand. And so this is with an app like uh, Google Authenticator is how uh, you would use TOTPs. This is a standardized uh, way of doing this. There's a RFC for this. And so there are a lot of apps out there there that you can use this for, but um, it's a standard across uh, the industry. And so most of the time that you see, you know, scan this with Google Authenticator, you can use an app like Authy to do that as well. Um, but there are downsides to this. This uses symmetric key encryption. That symmetric key is generally encoded in that QR code. And so like my last job, we, uh, we had 2FA turned on for some of the, uh, you know, the engineering accounts, but we stored that 2FA code in our shared uh, one password account. And so if anybody got access to that, that QR code, then it, you know, it doesn't really help our situation because, I mean, but that was the, the only way that we could have an account that had 2FA turned on. But like, you know, nobody made me take that off my phone when I quit that company. So there's, you know, downsides to using that type of security. And finally, I wanted to talk about other encrypted messaging platforms. And so you have things like WhatsApp, and you know you could look at like many of the different encrypted messaging uh, uh, applications out there for using this kind of thing. And so this would be similar to using SMS for 2FA. You would send a token um, uh, through this message. But the benefits of this are you know you, you do get that end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, you now have the ability to deliver messages via the internet or Wi-Fi, which is beneficial because not everybody has cell phone plans. These are things that we take for granted sometimes. And you 
you're limiting the telephony insecurities. And so it's, but it's still not a perfect solution. Um, there's risk out there. You know, uh, WhatsApp can still get hacked. Uh, WhatsApp is a private company, a private company that is owned by Facebook. Facebook has lost a lot of user trust recently. Um, so people that were ha uh, doing a lot of uh, single sign-on with Facebook uh, recently, so there were a lot of dating companies that were doing single sign-on with Facebook. And a lot of them started moving away from that because users didn't want to have to log in with a Facebook account. Um, so this is the same type of thing that like not everybody's going to have a WhatsApp account. Are they going to create a WhatsApp account just to use 2FA for your, for your company and for your authentication? These are things that we have to consider. Um, and at the end of the day, like what is the trust anchor for something like this? Like when you sign up for your WhatsApp account, you're using a phone number to validate that. And so we're still going back to that phone number as one of the anchors to verifying your identity. And that verification happened via SMS. And so there's not a perfect solution here. And I think you know, a lot of times we want to make sure that users have options. So I want to talk about Reddit. Um, on August 1st of this year, Reddit announced that they had been hacked. Um, if you want to read uh, good security write-ups of like post-incident responses, this was a great one. Um, and so they announced that they had a security incident and that employee accounts were compromised. And they said this was for things like cloud hosting providers and source control. So presumably things like Amazon Web Services and GitHub were hacked. Um, but the interesting thing about this was that Reddit employees were required to use 2FA on these accounts. Um, so their working theory was that it was SMS-based 2FA that was able to be bypassed. Um, and so they learned that SMS-based 2FA was not nearly as secure as we would hope. Um, they didn't ever explain how people actually got access to the usernames and passwords as well. We can assume that it was probably due to password reuse, but we don't know that. Um, and so SMS is the most common type of identity management, uh, or 2FA for identity management here. Um, and the factor in this case is the something you have, your phone. Um, but finally, I think we can talk about what goes wrong in terms of the value like with what's being protected with people. And I think Reddit gives us a, a good look at this. Um, so in my very official risk assessment here, you know, the, the incentive for people to hack you goes up as, as soon as your account value goes up. Um, and so it's not worth the impersonator's time to try to hack you if there's not a lot of value there. Um, so naturally, there's more incentive for higher accounts. Um, and I, I do want to mention that this is not only just for you know, money in accounts, but the value could be things like information control and power as well. Um, and so you can take these types of like models about your customers and uh, implement these into different forms of how you would do 2FA for the different types of people that you have. And so for someone like Reddit, um, what they ended up doing was requiring token-based 2FA for their employees. Um, they didn't explain what kind of tokens they were using, but we can assume that they're either using some kind of like YubiKey or you know even like an app like Google Authenticator uh, does have that token-based 2FA. Um, <sighs> But this is, it goes to show that the MFA that you use doesn't have to be the same for all of your users. Um, also uh, worth mentioning is that employee accounts can be managed by your IT department. And it's a lot easier for people to uh, use YubiKeys when they're employees of the company because your IT department can physically hand that to you on your first day and say, hey, if you want access to any of the stuff that you're using, you have to use this thing. Uh, if you're a user of Reddit, if you're a moderator, you probably don't have that same like connection with someone in the or Reddit IT department. Um, but maybe for moderators, someone like Reddit could use, uh, they could require 2FA of any kind for the moderators. And there's more incentive here for moderators to do this because they spend more time on Reddit, they're invested in this service. And so Reddit telling them that they need to turn on 2FA um, isn't as much of an annoyance to them. And then for everyone else, you can make 2FA optional. You can make the way that they do 2FA uh, optional. And so you can start to apply this to other industries as well. Um, you could look at these. And these are all just theoretical um, uh, ways that you can do this. But you know, if you're in banking, you could do it by account value. And so if you have a certain number of assets that you want to protect, you can make sure that people have, uh, you know, make sure that they turn on token-based 2FA if they have assets over, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and then if you're someone like Twitter, you know, maybe for verified accounts, you want to make sure that people have uh, token-based 2FA turned on. Um, if you have over a certain follower count, then you want to make sure that you have, you know, some kind of 2FA turned on. And for everyone else, make it optional. 
you don't want to make this barrier to entry too high when somebody just creates an account. Um, but you know, there are services out there that are requiring like very heavy types of multi-factor authentication, uh, even when you do a create, create accounts. But those are services like you know Coinbase and other uh, types of uh, Bitcoin companies or uh, uh, cryptocurrency companies because the risk there is so high that if somebody turns around and immediately buys five Bitcoin, they're immediately a target. Um, but I wanted to talk about like a specific example when it comes to authentication and how we can start to use uh, methods beyond SMS for doing this type of stuff. Um, and so there's a, a known weak point that I think we, when it comes to authentication that we don't always talk about, which is authentication via contact centers or over the phone authentication. Um, and so uh, this is, you know, you call into your, you know, ISP or your bank account, and there, there's usually like the other person on the end of the line is asking you for some kind of like in the US, it's often social security numbers that they're asking you to give. It's like nobody wants to give their social security number over the phone. You don't want to have to be giving like all of these things like your date of birth, your national ID number. Like there's a lot of things that people are asking for that are actually identifiers and not authenticators. And so um, Patrick McKenzie works at Stripe, which is a payments API company. And so he proposed this thing that you know Stripe started to do, which is if you have an authenticated web session and you call into uh, Stripe support, then they'll display a two-part number on the screen and then Stripe will say the first part of the number and you'll give them the second part of the number. And that becomes a, a tokenized way of verifying each other's identities. Um, because this is you know, one of those things that like, sometimes we get calls from our banks that are like, hi, you know, like, we need to want to inform you of like, something that happened with your account. Uh, can you verify your identity by you know, giving me your date of birth and your social security number? And it's like, wait, how do I even know this is my bank? Like, Phone number spoofing is totally possible. Like you don't want to be have to trust that the person calling you is who they say they are. Um, and so this is another thing that Twilio is currently working on. Um, so on the left is the contact center. So this would be the call center agent view, and on the right would be the um, the end user's application. Again, this does require that the user has an app installed. You can use this um, via you know some kind of SDK built into your own app if you wanted. But this is another way that like if the user the end user um, is getting the request from the call center agent saying like hey I'm going to verify your identity, um, and then you get that request which helps verify that they are they are who they say they are because you have some kind of account already set up with them. Um, and then you can also verify that you are who you say you are by authenticating this request. Um, and so I think with a lot of this stuff, like if you want to start implementing these types of solutions and if you want to start looking at what the solutions that are right for you are, even beyond SMS, you want to be measuring that effectiveness. Um, and this is obviously going to be easier if you have these metrics before you even started, but you want to track this. Um, and so these are some of the things that I recommend people look at when they start to try to like implement these solutions. And so you want to make sure that your losses due to account takeover are actually going down. If you start requiring that everybody uses token-based 2FA and you're not actually mitigating any of your losses, but your support costs relative to your losses are going way up, this is probably not even worth it for you. Um, and so this is one of those things that you want to be able to measure these things and the effectiveness on your business to understand that if this is having like a marketed effect on the, the amount of money that your customers are losing, the amount of time that they're investing into doing this. Um, maybe you want to look at the total number of compromised account. I mentioned the support cost. You might not care if your support costs go up. Um, you know, if you're someone like Coinbase, you probably are expecting your support costs to go up once you have all these like very complicated account recovery processes. Um, but you want to make sure that that's worth it in the end. And also you want to be keeping track of customer satisfaction because if you're having too many customers that are pissed off by the processes that you're implementing, if you're requiring multi-factor authentication and you don't have customers that are happy about that, then you want to be tracking that as well. Um, so I think as security people, it's really easy to get depressed about this stuff. Um, but remember that we're dealing with this every day. Uh, this is literally our livelihood. And so often it's worth it for us to you know, be thinking about this because it eases our minds. But we want to make sure that we're not putting that same type of burden on our end users. Uh, we are the paranoid people. And we're not thinking about prioritizing these different things. We're doing it all. Um, so it's our job to instill that right amount of paranoia into the developers that are uh, implementing these systems and into the end users that are, are doing this type of things, uh, making it as easy for them at the end of the day.
Um, and finally, try to avoid victim blaming. Um, instead, use some of the tools that we talked about um, and we discussed to make it easier for your customers to have good security hygiene. Um, I hope I've given you some information for how to think about your authentication. Uh, email me or tweet at me after this if you have any questions. Um, talking is very painful for me right now, so I'm going to avoid taking questions live because I need to stop. But thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.